morning, guys. Can you hear me? Ah, okay, perfect. So good morning, guys. Um, I would want to thank you all for coming to a of our interactive sessions and uh, um, about youth and climate action. This is with regards to the SDG number 13 on climate action. And uh, I'll, uh, I will be your moderator for today. And my name is Paris Francis. Uh, I work as a uh, project sustainability analyst and climate and doing projects that are uh, climate conscious is one of the greatest things that I've taken up on my life. And I hope all of us as youth and as youth ambassadors and advocates we will take climate uh, action to be something personal. It all starts with us. And with that said, um, I would want to, to say that every one of us has a big role to play. And to open up this session, I'll probably want to start with um, a quote from Desmond Tutu, the, the South African bishop, who said that 25 years ago, we, we, we would be excused for not knowing so many things about climate change and climate action. But right now, at the information age we are at, uh, we do not have an excuse, you know? So it's a personal initiative. And uh, with that uh, being said, I would like uh, to probably uh, start the session as we let in more people into the, into the session. And probably I'll start by introducing uh, uh, Robert Mukami, who will be our first uh, presenter of today. He is a climate change policy specialist and a program coordinator at the FES Kenya office. Forgive me, but I think my, my pronunciation for the word will be a bit off. So Robert Mutami, um, the stage is yours. Yeah, um, thanks a lot, Paris, and good morning, all of you. Uh, as Paris mentioned, my name is uh, Robert Mozami. I work for the Friedrich Gibbert Stiftung, uh, FES Kenya, in short, you are right, so uh, no worries. Um, I want to start us off um, in trying to um, share my perspectives uh, with regards to the climate crisis, um, what I think should be the place of young people um, and also um, where should we get involved. Let me thank um, the organizers for, of this particular uh, meeting, the Africa for SDGs. Um, this is a very innovative forum and thanks for bringing a couple of partners together. Um, and I strongly um, think that uh, the young people are very critical uh, in this kind of conversation and trying to push uh, the issue of climate change, um, one, in, in the policy space, two, um, in the practical aspect. And um, basically for the current and uh, future generations, it's very good that young people take the center stage um, in all this discourse. So um, the climate crisis and uh, with climate change, extreme weather events are becoming more frequent and intense. Um, and we see uh, destroying of livelihoods, economic activities, and also jobs. Um, temperatures are also continuing to increase. Um, more days of the year will become too hard to work. Uh, and by 2030, actually a report by the World Employment and Social Outlook report, the ILO uh, of 2018, um, that talks about greening of jobs. Uh, it says that uh, by 2030, Productivity losses due to temperature increase will be equivalent to a loss of 72 million full-time jobs. So uh, look at this from the African continent where um, we have a majority and a number of young people who do not have jobs. But with climate change, uh, this particular research tells us by the year 2030, um, 72 million full-time jobs, um, there is a probability of losing those kind of jobs. 
So the world's most vulnerable people, those facing poverty, inequality, and discrimination are those who face the negative impacts um, of environmental degradation the most. And promoting environmental sustainability is compatible with employment opportunities. And therefore, young people have a critical role to play in terms of uh, promoting environmental sustainability because one, um, we'll be creating more employment opportunities and uh, we'll, be address, we'll, be, we'll be securing the jobs that are, are already existing. So um, comparing climate change to a social crisis and uh, limiting the, the climate crisis is a, is a social challenge because climate crisis threatens the life and the well-being of millions of people. Robert, yes? Robert, you for a while. Sorry, um, would you kindly put on see you and if, like switch on your camera please okay can you hear me we can hear you but we cannot see you oh, okay you can see me now yes, we can see you <laughs> oh, okay so uh, what I'm saying is that um, the, the, the climate crisis is a social challenge, and um, uh, this threatens the, um, the life and the well-being of millions of people. It is an essential human rights, right to water, right to food, and right to um, even health are at risk because of the climate crisis. So the economic losses of today um, are amounting to about 520 billion US dollars um, annually. And um, if you look at the climate crisis and uh, look at the African continent, actually the African continent basically contributes 4% um, uh, of the total greenhouse gas emissions, which is actually very negligible, but it's highly impacted by climate change because of its vulnerability and even the capacity to, to, to adapt the impacts of climate change. So all countries um, will need to raise their ambitions because this is an international crisis. And if you look at um, the Paris Agreement, it tells us we should reduce greenhouse gas emissions by two degrees Celsius uh, with an ambition of the one, 1 1.5 degrees Celsius. But if you look at um, the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective cap capabilities um, in, the, in, in the UNFCCC framework, uh, the Global North have a big opportunity in trying to um, reduce the emissions um, and uh, this has not happened so far. So there is an element of sharing opportunities because uh, African countries are also developing, uh, their emissions are increasing, but we also have our partners in the North who, whose, who, whose emissions are, 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 are at a particular amount. So poorer parts of the society are more at the risk and have less capa capacities to adapt. But the bad news or the good news is that um, to avoid uh, the runaway climate change and global emissions um, must be zero by the year 2050. Whether it's achievable or not, young people have a role to play in trying to push some of these things in the policy space and even at the pra practical, uh, practical aspect. Technology and financial resources for transformation have to be made available. Young people have to be at the center, center stage in trying to um, provide innovations and also push for technology, um, for climate change adaptation and mitigation. Uh, we have to be at the center, center stage in trying to even pursue financial resources, what we call climate finance, um, for adaptation and mitigation. But the biggest challenge that we have is the lack of political um, with our countries. Because even if our nations in the, for, for developing countries like Kenya, for example, um, we have an opportunity to even enhance um, our climate change ad adaptation capability. But uh, we have policies in place. How we implement them depends on how we convince our government our actors. Do we have that political will? What is the space of young people in trying to ensure um, this is achievable? Um, then uh, a narrative is very important. And how we look at our climate change perspective is having basically significant impacts of um, in Africa and its effects are said to get worse. So um, from the African context, uh, climate change is a poverty issue. 
um, it is increasing poverty across the world. Countries in Africa continue to be poor. If you look at the COVID crisis, coupled with the climate change crisis, basically this is putting pressure into, even to the resources that are meant for development. And this is making our countries even more poor. It's an equity issue because um, it affects the poor countries more and even the vulnerable sectors of the society. It is a justice issue, basically because uh, the problem is greatly caused by developed nations and uh, developing countries, uh, for example, the ones in Africa, are highly affected. The other aspect is the economic aspect of climate change. Being an economic issue, uh, it is a stagnant growth um, in most of the African countries, um, while big economies fear cutting down the emissions because it will Your affect breaking. them in terms of Yes? Your connection, you seem to be breaking a bit. Okay. Um, so, um, so from an economic perspective, um, this is, um, is stunting growth um, uh, for most of the African countries. From a gender perspective, if you look at how climate change affects um, both men and women, um, then there is an aspect of young people being impacted highly, women because they do most of uh, the household cause, um, women in the rural areas, they are to go and fetch for water sector that is highly affected by climate change. Women at the local level also um, do much of the agricultural activities at a, at a small scale level. And therefore, this is an, is an area that is also affected by climate change. So women become even more vulnerable than men uh, based on the responsibilities that they take, even the young people. Humanitarian issue, if you look at the climate security, climate related, related security issues, uh, many catastrophes and also disasters happening because of climate change, they are leading to loss of livelihoods, they are leading to loss of infrastructure, and um, these are also caused by climate events. Um, a food security issue, climate change has a bigger impact on um, the, the food cycles in most of the, the African countries. Um, the changing conversation on climate change um, and the percep perception on climate change is changing over the years. Where we are at the moment is not um, the kind of situation that we had 10 years ago. Though we may differ on what action we may take and the consensus across the world is that climate change has changed and someone somewhere has caused the problem. It's no longer um, an isolated scientific issue and an environmental issue. It has dimensions in um, all the development indicators. So um, um, though we all agree we should take action and um, an effective climate governance pact as elusive. Kindly switch off your microphones, kindly. Thank you. Go on, Robert. Yes, so uh, what I was saying is that um, even with the Paris Agreement that we have, um, we continue to have a mistrust between the South and the South. And um, we thought that having the Paris Agreement could help us in trying to uh, address the climate crisis. But um, from the negotiations that I've, te I've attended since 2015 after the adoption of the Paris Agreement, we continue with the blame game and the finger pointing between industrialists and poor countries. Yet we are not addressing the climate uh, problem. The global geopolitics, if you look at the position of the US at the moment in terms of climate change being one of uh, being actually the second emitter of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, they still hold their position that they are not so, they are either in or out of the climate change uh, space. Influential business multinationals and corporations limited interest. And um, this continues to be a problem because um, most of the biggest emitters, they are actually from the multinational corporations and um, they engage with the governments in those particular, they collude with the governments in those particular level and this continues to be a problem existence of other competing priorities which require attention and interventions, PG insecurity, terrorism, outbreak of diseases, this take um, a center stage more than the climate crisis. And uh, we as the young people have a space in trying to pursue, uh, to, to build a narrative of climate change that we can convince our government to put money into it, to enhance technology and innovation in terms of addressing uh, the climate crisis. 
So um, looking at the economic risks of climate change in Africa and why a radical shift is necessary perspective um, is that uh, where we are at the moment is that poverty, inequality and unemployment remain key risks that are increased by the climate change impacts. And this resonates to the young people. Water security, food insecurity, energy insecurity, um, biodiversity loss, um, we are also losing natural resources. And um, some of the sectors that are highly impacted, um, we have the energy sector, the agricultural sectors that, that actually contributes, um, that uh, provides more than 60% of jobs in Africa is highly affected by climate change. So in Africa, we have um, a, a, a chance to lose even many jobs in sectors that provide many jobs and livelihoods for our people the transport sector, tourism, and also the health sector, they are highly affected by climate change. And therefore, um, these are sectors that touch on our economic aspects in Africa. Then if we do not um, uh, pursue the climate change issue in trying in, from even a youth perspective, then we may find ourselves in a situation where we are not able to sustain um, our livelihoods. So where should we be? And where we should be is that um, an environmentally sustainable society, an expanded low economy uh, development pathway, that's an economy and reduced emissions. So uh, where we should be, it's an area where we should be addressing poverty. We should be addressing uh, unemployment to socially sustainable levels as emissions reach a plateau. So driving rural communities are providing an economic and social base for a significant number of people. Urban development is more compact and um, where urban, urban development is more compact and energy efficient, we should be at a level where investment in low carbon and climate resilient infrastructure to enable countries export and profit from its technologies and skills and benefit sectors that um, deliver enhanced um, energy, food and water security, new high quality job opportunities and improved quality of life. That's where um, we should be. The other area where we should be at the we, we should be looking at is that our country well capacitated and comfortable, uh, comfortably manage our policies um, and support functions. We should also be at a level where transitions aligned with African countries' efforts to address uh, poverty and inequality. Um, the other area that the way we should be is that various incentive framework. Um, and a suit of co a comprehensive carbon pricing policies have catalyzed high levels of private investment. Um, so, but how do we get there? That's where we are supposed to be, where we are, where we are supposed to be, but how do we get there? What do we really need as I move to conclusion? So we need to ensure that we have a long-term um, planned and managed transition that sets out have a, a vision of long-term end state together with pathways to get there and milestone, mile, mile, milestones. Is the economy and society wide in scope? So we should be looking at uh, if we are pursuing um, a growth in our economy, if that should have a multiply effect to how people improve their livelihoods um, in their day-to-day -day lives. And that is, resonates to how young people uh, should actually be living their lives. So places of eradicating poverty and inequality should be at the center stage. Uh, we should be at a level where our society is just um, and equitable. So um, in trying to frame our conversations and our development paradigms in a way that they are just and equitable. So um, if we start from that perspective in trying in the framing aspect and using narratives that resonate to people from a just and equitable way, that is the basis of get where we want to go. So from my young people's perspective, then let us look at the justice and uh, equitable aspect as a key parameter in trying to frame some of these um, issues around climate justice that we want to engage in and even as we pursue or we push policy narratives. So um, the other things that we should also look at is the transformative and the urgent nature of scale and the issue of transparency and inclusivity. Young people should be at on the table. So um, then uh, the other thing is that we should tackle and resolve issues. How much? 
who pays and who bears the cost. Because if you look at the climate change, yes, um, from a Kenyan perspective or from the African perspective, we are highly impacted, but we contribute very little to greenhouse gas emissions. So and resolve the issues, and this resonates to the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities. Who pays? Who bears the costs? So the other aspect is the role of the energy efficiency um, and the energy mix. The role of um, um, renewable energy into um, the economic development of our countries. How do we build resilience of communities, economic sectors, um, in trying to avoid um, the, the, the dangerous impacts of climate change. Uh, how do we maximize job creation and how do we deal with job losses? That is a discussion that young people should be the, at the center of this. How do we provide incentives to people who promote, um, who promote green jobs uh, and who, pro, who promote uh, the transition to low carbon development pathway? When, where, and how do you cushion the poor? So that is one of the issues that we should look at when we are thinking about how do we get, how do we get where we want to be uh, when we are addressing the climate crisis. When, um, how do we deal with trade-offs, lock-ins, and also the sunken cost? How do we shape and also structure the energy industry, the competitiveness, and also how do we structure, uh, restructure our economies, uh, both in Africa and even the countries in the North? Um, then how should our development uh, model uh, look like? So um, the second last, last aspect that I want to talk about is how youth must be involved and engaged. Um, from the regional level and the, the international level, the regional integration blocks um, provide an opportunity for young people to engage in trying to how our countries are implementing, for example, the Paris Agreement through the national determined contributions. Number two, how our East African community, for example, are uh, ECOWAS from the West Africa, uh, ECAS from Central Africa, um, then also SADC from Southern Africa, all these economic blocks, how should young people package um, themselves in trying to ensure that uh, we push a narrative that resonates um, to our issues as young people in addressing the climate crisis. Um, the UNF to proceed level and the, impl the implementation of the Paris Agreement, because um, now um, the responsibility to address uh, climate change is coming down uh, to local action. How do we engage in the international negotiations? What is our space there? What are the issues that we want to pursue there? How do we influence our, even our country issues in ensuring that what our countries want to implement through the national determined contributions resonate with the issues that the young people think uh, should be uh, at the critical stage. The agenda 2030. And um, if you look at um, uh, the, the 17 uh, goals, SDGs, and you talked of goal, goal number 13, a uh, goal number 13 has an aspect of linking with the other goals. If you look at, for example, goal number five on gender equality, it has an aspect of climate change because you talk about how climate change uh, impacts um, men, women, and even young people. If you look at, for example, uh, goal number eight on decent work, um, it has a climate change aspect because if we have to have decent jobs, then there must be an aspect of environmental sustainability into them. If you look at, for example, um, goal number six, 17 on partnerships, all these things we must address, um, we must partner with other people. Young people have to partner with other people and other uh, organizations and even other countries in trying to address uh, the climate crisis. So what I'm trying to say, uh, we must play a critical role um, in the implementation of, of the SDGs. Uh, how do we uh, build a nexus of goal number 13 with the other uh, goals? At the national level, um, and in the development of um, the, the, uh, the climate change policies um, at, uh, at, at, at the national level, young people have a, a place in trying to shape how policies, climate change policies are developed and implemented at the national level. And I'm proud that there are young people um, who have played a very critical role into this. At the local level, the innovation, um, implementation of local actions on climate change, adaptation and mitigation, young people should also showcase best practices 
if there are things that you are doing at the local level and they are innovative enough in addressing climate crisis, they can find their, themselves in the, in the police space. But is there a space for young people to engage at that particular level? And I'm proud to say that I've um, worked along with young people who have engaged in the development of the climate change um, uh, policies. And uh, probably one of the young people is here. I can give him one minute before I move to my last slide to conclude. Um, Julius, probably you may, you may share um, how you've uh, tried to engage in the national climate change policies at the national level in one minute so that we don't uh, eat into the time of the other speakers. Um, uh, in trying basically to share how some of the young people are engaging and how even ourselves can take that chance in trying to engage in the climate change space. Julius. Wow. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Julius, ah. but you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity. My name is Julius Mbatia. I coordinate youth for SDGs uh, Kenya, and I'm happy to share briefly. So there's a lot of work that we've been able to do um, on influencing policies at the national and the global levels, and particularly being able to change the perspectives within government on how the young people can actually cause a transformation within uh, the policy frameworks that we have. So we've been able to one Julia, get to Julia, understand Julia, sorry for interrupting you. Is it possible for us to see you at least? We would love to see the speakers. Yeah, uh, I'm asking Julius to switch on his camera. And we are also live on Facebook. We can also share with our friends. Thank you. Okay, as Julius um, um, comes up, um, uh, so let me let, let me just conclude. Um, I you can, you can say his points uh, um, as we conclude. So in conclusion, um, young people no longer engage as less parties. We can only engage as equal partners if we have to address the challenge ahead of us. Um, so let us uh, feel part and parcel of the process and being important. Um, in this There's process. someone's microphone that's on. Kindly switch it off if you're not the speaker, please. Thank you. Robert, please go on. Sorry for interrupting. Yes, what I'm trying to say is that um, youth and young people are no longer um, should not engage as lesser parties. We have a critical role and we should take that space to engage as we equal partners together with the other people in order to address the, the challenge that is ahead of us and this climate change. As the African youth, we have to speak with one voice. Let us not have uh, young people uh, trying to chart their own um, advocacy plan or development plan. We have to speak with one voice and we have to work and do it from the grassroots level. Let us mobilize each other. Let us look at the issues that um, relate to young people in terms of climate change. How do we build a critical mass and a movement for young people? You, you need to be firm. If you do not believe that, if you do not believe that youth can be transformative part of the world, then please do not come to the party. And uh, that is my parting shot. Uh, maybe Julius, if you are here, you can just conclude with what you are sharing. Um, so that at least I give the opportunity to the rest of the speakers. Thanks. Imam, will you kindly switch off your microphone? Thank you. All right. Thank you, Robert. And apologies again. Uh, I'm in the field and uh, I have put on my mask every time. So my name is Julius Batia. I work with Christian Aid, but I'm also the convener of uh, a platform called Youth for SDGs Kenya. Uh, but also I represent African civil society organizations in the Green Climate Fund. 
board um, of the UN. Thank you, Robert. So uh, as I was mentioning is that we have, as Robert has mentioned, actually, we have to engage as equal parties. But also there's always a challenge when you're starting the process. At times you're deemed to have a little or rather less of information and knowledge as young people. So there's a perspective change that needs to happen. So what we've been able to do throughout the policy development process is first get to challenge the notion that we do not have a lot of knowledge as young people by continually building capacity amongst ourselves. Um, climate change is very broad. It depends also with the area of interest. You could follow climate finance issues. You could follow uh, technology and development issues. You could climate policy making processes in the country. For instance, um, we have the UN uh, international climate talks that happen every year. And before that happens, we have a whole lot of, inter, in, uh, of, of consultations within the country. So do you understand that these spaces are actually there? What are those strategic meetings you need to attend to inform and also present your perspectives as a young person? So through that, we've been able to also be part of the country's negotiation team uh, representing young people in uh, to some of these international climate change negotiation meetings. And then thirdly, I will say that it's also important to know uh, how your policy asks result into practice. So whatever you're asking for, is it practical in practice and will it support the transformation that we young people are always calling for at the country level? So that's a very important thing so that we can turn our asks into things that are tangible at the end of the day. And that's the point or the area where we talk about policy meeting practice. So is it possible that your ideas are actually integrated in policy? Because if it's not policy, if it's not in policy, it doesn't exist. So how do we then uh, resort or rather how do we influence policy to contribute to it and advance our practices as young people, advance the change we want um, and also make sure that climate change actions at the end of the day are also meeting youth needs and also the, the urgency to actually address some of the challenges that young people face, for example, employment issues. Um, I think, let me just say that for now, I don't want to take much time. I'm seeing a question on the of the chat, which Robert would maybe respond to, uh, or I would respond to, uh, depending on the time also allowed. Thank you very much. Robert, I think you can go on to answer the question. Yes, um, thanks. Um, I just saw a question on the chat. Um, uh, uh, basically, how far have we gone with the goal number that you target on implementing commitment undertaken by developed country parties to the UN framework convention to go? So the, the mobilization of the 100 billion uh, US dollars through the Green Climate Fund, I can say that um, um, this is still a pipe dream. Uh, we've not um, mobilized even um, a third of uh, that particular uh, amount of money. So in terms of... Uh, actually like the, the, the global action into the climate crisis, we are still lagging behind. And um, so uh, in terms of the mobilization of the resources for both adaptation and mitigation, um, this, this is still a challenge. And uh, that's where we are saying that uh, still we have the pull and push. Um, that's where we still have a pull and push in terms of uh, uh, the commitments. Um, climate change, um, uh, mitigation and adaptation in terms of finances. So climate finance still remains a big obstacle in addressing the climate crisis. And uh, not unless uh, we, are, we, are, we are serious with this particular aspect in terms of providing uh, the finances that are required, the capacity that, are, that, that is required, um, and even the technology, basically the means of implementation, then we are far away uh, in terms of addressing the climate crisis. If you look at the African countries, for example, I can say um, African countries may be doing very well because we are actually using our domestic resources that are, they should be meant for other development priorities like construction for constructions of roads and other um, development uh, paradigms. So, um, so um, we are actually are using our domestic resources, but we are not getting the international 
financing that we, we need for our own adaptation and, and mitigation needs at the local level. So that's where we are. Um, and we really need to continue pushing uh, for more uh, mobilization of climate funds, either through the Green Climate Fund, the adaptation fund that is, is now serving the Paris Agreement um, with respect to, to, the, to the decisions and the Paris, and the Paris Agreement, uh, and even the multilateral and bilateral funds. Therefore, as young people, we have a push for mobilization of more uh, climate funds. So let me stop at that, thanks. Okay, um, there's also a question on the chat to Julius. Will you kindly go ahead yeah, sure. And thanks again for the opportunity. So in Kenya has got a robust climate change policy framework and uh, different climate change actions are actually integrated with those different policy frameworks. Uh, just to give an example, uh, one uh, in 2010, we actually released the Kenya climate change uh, strategy, the National Climate Change Strategy, which is a roadmap on how climate change should be addressed. It covers on the gaps, uh, the climate gaps of the country. And then moving forward, we have now the development of the National Climate Change Action Plan, uh, which initially was uh, five year, and then it was reviewed to 2018 to 2022. That is another five years. And uh, that action plan actually is very, very in depth in terms of looking at different actions, that those are climate change actions across sectors, uh, but also the action plan is the one that allows county governments to mainstream climate change within the development planning at the county level. Beyond that also, it's more of the roadmap in terms of implementing Kenya's commitment to the UN uh, when it comes to uh, our, our commitment to reducing emissions uh, that within the nationally determined contributions. Uh, the other frameworks that are really important, we have the Kenya Climate Change Law, the national law, which uh, the 2016 law, really important for us to look at what kind of institutional frameworks are being proposed in there, but also uh, in terms of strategies and planning, uh, in terms of the process now. So every county government right now is mainstreaming or rather integrating climate change into development planning. And it's also supposed to be done at the sector level. So all these are some of the actions that we can do. Please check out those policies. They're really good. And you can be able to see how the measures are integrated. Yeah, thank you. Um, and uh, this is just a general question, probably um, someone who's joining this forum for the first time and is thinking, we've had all these catastrophes coming our way. Is it too late, you know? to deal with issues with uh, related to climate change like are we late you know to prevent the climate change no i can say we are not late um we should actually uh take this opportunity because we are not yet like um at the extreme levels but we are heading there so we are that um opportunity where um if we are able to reduce like the, the greenhouse gas emissions um, and also try to enhance the adaptation efforts and putting measures in place in terms of how communities could adapt to the impacts of climate change, then um, will shape a trajectory um, that uh, provides a low carbon development pathway. Yes, countries will continue developing, uh, but develop in a sustainable manner. So I would say that we are, this is the time. And young, as young people, we have now the chance to even build a critical mass um, in trying to pursue um, a, a, a development pathway that is not carbon intensive. So we are not at that particular extreme level, but we are heading there. So let us take this, this opportunity in trying to um, as young people stand by authority in addressing the climate crisis. Thanks. Nice, nice. Thank you for that. I see on the chat that Julius has written that um, in brief, Kenya's climate policy framework is robust. Uh, various policies that integrate diverse measures exist and the National Climate Change Strategy, National Climate Change Action Plan, the Adaptation Plan, the National Climate uh, Finance Policy. So you can probably reach out to him. He's given his email address on the chat. And I think you've really given um, great insight into this whole climate uh, scenario. And what stands out in both of your, of your presentations is that, you know, uh, policy has to meet practice, you know? And if your ideas are not incorporated in policy, then 
there's nothing you can do about it. You, you, you just remain with your amazing ideas, which cannot be implemented and cannot help fight the climate change. So someone from Youth for SDGs will probably um, say something uh, before we get to the breakout session. James, probably. Uh, yes, yes, thank you so much. Um, let me also do as other people are doing, uh, starting videos. Um, yes, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm so happy about the presentation that has just happened. Allow just me to uh, use a few minutes of our time to share something here about um, more about the youth in Africa, just in a few minutes, and then we call it a day. I don't see, I don't know if you guys can see my screen. Can you? Paris? No. Right. No, I can. And now we can write. So I'll, I'll just talk about uh, this population on uh, slide two. Slide two, if you look into this population, and that's what we do a lot uh, from Africa for SDGs. As you can see, we are engaging all these organizations, and we are so happy about the prowess they have on youth engagement. Just look into this um, population here, from the north to the south. We have teens population. We have the, the, the youth at 20s and at 30s, South African region, North African region. And then we have the population in between, which is now where Kenya lies, Somalia, and other countries. There's a question we should ask ourselves as you look at this. Just ask yourself, is this a big opportunity for young people to do something in their communities? <clears throat> is it, <clears throat> sorry, is it a really a chance for you as a youth leader or uh, as an organization to focus more into young people as we talk about climate change? How can we then engage these young people? As you can see, the population is really big. How can we do, or what can we do to engage them for, 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 for great change and for global, but <clears throat> for local uh, initiatives, which are really global. We call that locally. How can we engage them locally? Like doing things locally, but internationally or globally. So if you look at that median age, 19.4, the, the median age for Africa, uh, which is next 60 plus percent of the population under 25. Something we should know just briefly is that young people are passionate. These young people are really ready to learn and share faster. And they are really, they hold really great positions which are of great influence in their spheres and their, their levels and within their peers. They are really confident and people who are really competent about youth works and even innovations, then they are keen to learn and ready to use the technical skills they have to change the society. So that's all we wanted to share, but just allow me just go to another one here. The same population, if you look again, the ages, if you look at these, uh, the Sudan, Chad, Somalia, Ethiopia, Kenya, Tanzania, you can look at the age there. You find that we have between 15 to 19 years of age, uh, between 30s, the 30s, the northern, more into north and south. And then, of course, again, the teens population, which is the median age, the youngest in the world, which runs between the middle Africa and East Africa. So we shall share again more tomorrow. That is all I wanted to share for now, just the population of young people. Thank you so much. My name is James Munyao. Wow. Thank you, James, for that. Um, I think uh, we will we will um, go into the next speaker and then we can have the breakout session later, right? Yes, of course, thank you. Okay, perfect. So the next speaker is Dr. Monica Wangeshi Ndurito. Uh, she's a climate change adaptation expert, a lecturer in the geosciences and environmental department um, of, techno of uh, the Technical University of Kenya, that is TUC. Uh, she is also an urban farm expert uh, and a member of the Environmental Institute of Kenya and a uh, licensed environmental and social impact assessment slash audit uh, lead expert. And she's also a specialist in monitoring and evaluation. Welcome, Dr. Monica. 
if I may interrupt a little bit, uh, we have the other guys on the technical side of it, and that be how many minutes do we have towards this so that we can guide the speaker? And that is. Hello, we have your question, please. Sorry? Repeat your question. How many do we have? 25. 25. Okay, thanks, Andati. Okay. Is Monica with us? Yes, hi. Hi. How are you? We're fine, thank you. Welcome. Asante. Uh, My name is uh, Wangashi Nderitu, as you've heard. I have a PhD in climate change and, and, uh, and adaptation from University of Nairobi. And so my, my interest actually is so much on the social aspect of the climate change, which uh, Robert has already given a highlight on and which uh, was a very good presentation on, on policy and uh, the, the governance issue of climate change. So, and I would like to thank you, uh, you Katile, I don't know whether she's in the group and for inviting me. It is just something that got me off, off guard, but I, got, I ran with it and I'm very excited to be here. And I think we can uh, start, I know, I don't know whether all of us knows what climate change is. Maybe we are just talking and maybe there's somebody who really does not understand whether we have every day I see the weather is changing in the morning, it is cold, in the afternoon it's a bit warm. But maybe I should just say when you're talking about climate change, you're talking about the the average condition of weather, or that is all the parameters in weather, meaning the, the temperatures, the, the rainfall, the humidity the wind and so on over a period of a long period of time, which could be probably from 30 years and above. So, and when you're talking about weather, it is the, the state of, of the weather, the state of how, how are we, the state of atmosphere, I should say, at a given time and at a given place. So we should just uh, understand that, that we have that difference between the climate change and the weather but they are all interconnected and weather is what builds up to the climate that we are talking about. So from the, from Katila, there were a few things that I was supposed to, to touch on and I was supposed to talk, to talk on um, urban farming and uh, the global climate change uh, state. So I think I should start with how, where we are and then we go on to the adaptation part of it because I think the urban farming will come in as a, an adaptation strategy. So as of last year, when we had the COP25 uh, in Madrid, we, there, are, there are a few things that had already been noted in terms of climate change. And it is said that um, the 2019, which is last year, and uh, was the, the second most warmest year in, on record. So it, it was really hot. I don't know whether people can remember how warm uh, that year was. And we had uh, an increase of 1.1 degrees Celsius uh, above the pre-industrial period, that is between the 1850 and the 1900. So 2019 was very, very warm or very hot. We, we may put it in, in quotes to, to, to accommodate everyone who is, who is here because I'm, I'm sure all of us are not climate scientists. So, but we, we have uh, some knowledge about that. And therefore, we sh we're, in terms of the, of, of the warming, we know that the greenhouse gases contribute so much on the, the warming of the atmosphere or of the earth. And therefore, we, by, that, by, by last year, we were at 410 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the in the atmosphere that might be a bit about be a bit technical but if you compare from the 1750 the pre-industrial uh, state we had about 277 parts per million but as of today we are above 410 parts per million so you already see that we have we have an increase and the most unfortunate thing is that this state is increasing because Business is as usual. I have not seen a, a lot happening in terms of reducing our emissions. We are still, um, uh, most of the economies are really depending on the, the coal or the petrol, petroleum-based 
the carbon-based uh, energy sources. And therefore, unless we do something, as Robert said, on, on how we restructure our economies in terms of energy, our different sectors, to the transportation, and so on and so forth, this scenario is going to continue. And I remember Paris asking if, if this if there's something that we can do about this climate change. Yes, there's something that we can do. Now, when you, you, you look at the, the increase in uh, amount of carbon, and we know that carbon, we take carbon as the base, but we have other greenhouse gases that we, we, we talk about, the methane, the chlorofluorocarbons, and so on and so forth. All these contribute to this uh, greenhouse effect that affect the, the earth and increases uh, the warming. So the, the basic thing that we need to, uh, to understand right now is that our carbon budget is very depleted. And when I'm talking about carbon budget is that the, the tolerable amount of carbon dioxide that the atmosphere can hold. Remember the atmosphere is very important on the, uh, a very important carbon sink, of, of course, among other like the oceans and so on and so, and the forests. So we need to think about our carbon budget and see how we should cut on our emissions so that we can be able at least to accommodate, um, to accommodate, uh, give me a minute. My connection is, my connection is. Okay. As, as we await her to reconnect, um, some of the key points uh, that she's talking about are, we, we have a great role to play in this whole climate change scenario. And as she was answering to my previous question that we are not late, you know, it, it is time and it is now. We cannot wait until the damage is irreversible. We have to act now because we, we, we are in a position to do so. So welcome back. Thank you. So, so that's the basic uh, about the climate change. And, and, and therefore, when you're talking about uh, the causes of climate change, which all, most of us could be knowing, but we know that uh, the major aspect of uh, or contributor to the climate change we, we could be, I know some of you maybe have studied and there are people who are the naysayers that there's no climate change. We know that there's this natural climate change that happens. Of course, you know, the, the, the natural greenhouse effect that naturally occurs, that maybe in, in a certain period of time, the, the earth will rotate, uh, uh, will orbit in, yeah, up to this point. And the weather, of course, will change. And that's why sometimes we have the autumn, we have this, the, these seasons in different areas. But the worst climate change uh, that is happening is the one that we call the anthropogenic uh, uh, driven climate change, which is, which is basically what human beings are doing to the climate. So through our acts, through our activities, our economic development, we have exacerbated the effects of climate change or we have just messed the climate system and that's why we are experiencing what we're experiencing today so the causes of climate change are i'm going to, to concentrate on what us human beings are doing and it is because that is what we can control what god has we we might not be able to control but there are things that we can be able to do to control our climate change and therefore we know that through uh, for example, our transportation system had already mentioned that we emit a lot of, of carbon to the atmosphere, which is contributing to the climate change. We, are, we also know that we have changed our land use. The land use change, and especially if you look at Nairobi, for example, we or in, uh, in Kenya, for example, so an example that I really saddens my, my heart is that I don't know whether it was by design or by... Uh, Personally, I feel, for example, we didn't have to have Nairobi where it is because as we start the capital city of, of Kenya where it is, because you know what comes to the, the development of the capital city, a lot of land is required for development. If you look currently at what has happened in Nairobi, now we have the greater metropolitan, which is eating all the way to Thika, all, and eating all the way to uh, Kajiado, some parts of Kajiado. And these are all the agricultural lands that are the arable agricultural lands that we used to have. 
all of them we have converted into, into these flats, these uh, residential areas, the industries. And therefore it means that we have converted the natural arable land to concrete. We are not going to have more food from the most, uh, most uh, productive areas, for example. We have also changed the landscape of, for example, for Kajiado, we know that it's a pastoralist area that is supposed to kind of remain that way, but we have interfered with the environment and changed the, the land use. It therefore means if the terrains, the water runs off, you know, everything is concrete. And therefore these are some of the things contributing to what uh, we are having today. We are increasing the certification. We are cutting down trees. And remember, we know that are the, one of the the carbon sinks they 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 store for us the carbon that uh, that we emit so we don't have this these lungs of the environment that are supposed to suck in the carbon the much carbon that we are taking away so we are cutting down trees we are clearing bushes and all these things are contributing to the uh, the current uh, climate change that we we are exp experiencing today and therefore, in that, uh, uh, I'm trying to rush a bit because I know we are many. There is also uh, something else that we need to look you at. Still when have we have 20 about... minutes. So. Okay, I know. Yeah, it's all right. I, I know that there are also other things that um, that come now with with this our activities, our behaviors, and these are the consequences. We are always told that your actions, your choices, have consequences. And in this case. Our actions of, of um, destroying the environment, not caring about conservation of, or protection is bringing the consequences that the mother nature is giving us. And we have seen all these uh, things they are on our eyes. We have seen the physical effects or consequences of climate change. For example, we've seen flooding, which we've had uh, as of recent, I've seen Baringo, we have had a lot of flooding. And even we have had the, the narrow bees, uh, bee flies that were really affecting that place. These are the consequences of climate change that if you mess with the, with the environment, mother nature does not forgive. You construct a house on top of a spring. It doesn't matter whether now the spring is dry, but the day that the, the water, the nature decides that the, the course will take part and the course will take go as it was supposed to be in the 1900. The water, the rain will come and it will reach that building and that building will go down. One thing that we cannot fight is the, the law of nature, that some things will just happen the way they are supposed to happen. And therefore, we have a role, a bigger role as human beings, as logical human beings, to know that, of course, here we had, and we have science that is advising us. We have the geological studies, we have the environmental studies that have been done that we are supposed to incorporate in our development such that you know that in the 1950, this place used to have maybe a waterway, but it has dried up because of the changes in the climate. In the climate. But this does not mean that things cannot reverse back to what they were. So at some point, maybe the rain will come in a place where there never used to be, to be rain and it will come and pass through that place. So we need to think about that. We need to be to think about issues interco in the interconnectedness of the environment. And one of the theory that I like always to, to give people to think about is the chaos theory, which, which says that, well, you know, a butterfly can shake, shake uh, the air in Nairobi. They just do something in Nairobi, but the, the multiply effect or the, the, the bubbles will just go as far as America. So when you're talking about uh, climate issues, you should not think about, I have heard Robert saying that uh, Africa, for example, we have not emitted as much, and it is true. We are, have emitted so far 4% of, of the global climate uh, uh, pollution or effect. But that does, this does not mean that we do not have something to do to mitigate the climate change, because whatever happens, the issue that we are continuing to add into this climate mess, it is still going to affect us. And the most unfortunate thing is that the people in Africa, we are going to be highly and very hard hit by the effects of climate change. So I would, I would, I would like to advise all the youth, all of us, to be able to look at the issues as an interconnected, in an interconnected way. We should not separate 
issues. But I know, of course, that when you're talking about climate change adaptation, some of us, like the African states and the Asian states, we are a bit disadvantaged in terms of, of, uh, of technology, in terms of financing. And so, therefore, sometimes we are forced, or, or almost all the times we are forced to listen to the developed countries who are the biggest, uh, the biggest um, polluters. And I think this is where our youth should come in, in to, to raise their voices, to advocate, to advocate on, on our fair or equity, the, the equitable share that we, we need. They need to think about Africa and how much we have, of course, uh, polluted, how much have we developed? Because in any case, whether there's climate change or not, we still need to develop. And we need, still need to reach to that point that the other developed countries are. And sometimes we are we will be forced to use some of these uh, carbon-based uh, fuel and energy, but it doesn't have to go that way because we also have more resources. We have the geothermal power, for example. We have the solar uh, power we can be able to harness. And I know these are areas that they, our youth can be able to, to champion and come up with, you can contribute to the national grid. You can decide, uh, let us push a force that we can be able to, uh, to, to push the government to give us a space to be able to collect the waste that is in the, the waste that is in, in Nairobi, for example, let us harness it, let us produce biogas, and let us also contribute to the national grid and have our income, as the, and at the same time, that we are able to save the environment. So there is something that the youth can be able to do, and I think we need to have a fronted and a very strong one voice that we, you know, if you move as a, as a one voice, I'm very sure that people will listen to you, even the policymakers are going to listen to, to the youth. So there's something that we can do to reduce the impacts of this uh, climate change and its uh, negative or adverse impact to, on us. So we've said the natural, uh, the natural, the physical science, we have seen them, we have seen the droughts. We've, we've been there even contributing, Kenya for Kenyans. You know, a Ken Kenyan for a Kenyan contribution to save lives uh, in, um, in places that have, especially in the semi-arid areas in Kenya. So all this, any Kenyan knows about it and we have seen it. And therefore we need, really need to do something about, uh, about that. So, and even as we talk about that, we also have the, uh, the health impact, the health impact of climate change, which it's, uh, right now, currently we are battling with the COVID-19 we, we really don't know what, what really caused it, but I also feel that this, it has to be something to do with how we behave or how we interact, we are interact with our environment. How, how much are we pushing the environment? How much are we stretching it? Are we within the limits? Are we within the boundaries of how much the, the environment can take? Because even you as a human being, if you pushed, you reached at the point that you're stressed and even you can you get depressed or something happens to you it is the same thing i like i would like us to think about the environment as just like us our bodies such that there is so much that you you cannot take to everything and too much you have limits and therefore we've seen that with the with the issues where with the climate change it has it is really contributing a lot to health issues not only to increasing the, the, the pests and the parasites and the pathogens that are there, which we think even the COVID-19 is one reason why we are having this COVID-19 is that interaction, but we also have stress, the mental health that come, up, come with uh, climate change. We've seen that when, when we have the dry, dry, dry seasons in, 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 in Kenya, for example, people are not feeding well. People are stressed, where do I get the, mess, the next meal for my children, especially for parents? People have to move, for example, I know I have done a research that the, the communities, the pastoralist communities have to move to a very far region and move on and, and uh, I, 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 they go and they get, remarry other women from other men and those men that uh, their wives have, have been stolen, you no, know, they, they, they become, you know, mentally, affected and it is really something that I have I've seen and talked with people who are who are really going 
through these issues. So there is a lot to do with mental health. There's a lot to, be, to do with the vector borne uh, diseases, the increase in pests and, and parasites. We know that a lot has, um, we, we currently, I don't know whether the, the locusts have really gone or the COVID has really taken up, but I know the locusts are still there in some parts of Africa and in some parts of Kenya. These are things that are driven by the changes of climate uh, system. The, the warmer the climate, the more pathogens, the more, uh, the more parasites we are experiencing as, as we move on. I know all these are going to affect our livelihoods, for example, and the minute your livelihood is affected, and you know, basically, for example, in Kenya, we have the 80% of us, we depend on farming. We are an agricultural-based economy. So the minute that this rainfall is not coming because we have interfered with the, with, with the, with the system in terms of the forest and how, how we, we, we treat our, our environment, then it means that our, our pockets will no longer have, man, have money for most of us. It means that our children will not be able to go to school because we don't have money to take to buy uniform, to buy to pay school fees, and so on and so forth. And all this inter goes round and round. And I said, remember about the interconnectedness of, of climate change. It affects our health, it affects our economy, and it affects our social relations that, that we could be having. So there are those uh, deep-seated uh, issues that we, we, we do have. Now moving on to the next thing that it was the, the global, the climate action, which uh, uh, Robert spoke about very well he, uh, on, on what we should do as the young people. And one of the things I know about the climate action, it is that it, is, it calls for an agent. So there's some sort of agency in how we deal with this climate change, because if we fail to deal with it, it is actually going to deal with us. And there's nothing that we are going to do about mother nature. So we must do something. We must be friendly to the environment so that it can be friendly uh, to, to us. We give and take. So we have to reciprocate its, 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 its generous uh, nature uh, back. So we need to do something about that. Another thing is that we must, everyone must be on board. So whether it is a child, whether it is a young girl, whether it is a young boy, whether it is a youth, a teenager, we all must be in this action. We must be in this front to fight uh, the issues of climate change. And why I even mentioned about children is because I realize I've moved to places where I know people interact with the environment. You see that when a baby is small, they, from the time they are young, they are treated to love the environment, which I think it is not the case for us. For some, some of us, we, 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 our children do not even want to touch the soil because they feel that it is, that is not for them. But I think we also need to change. And it is good that this forum is for young people who are going to be the next, next uh, generation parents. Can you start by engaging your children, show them that the environment is it's not just a product of, uh, we used to have this, this, um, this traditional economic principle uh, factors of production. And I remember land, which environment falls in, used to be told it is that we must maximize utilization of this land to get the maximum, the optimal income or benefit. But I had, I never had at any point when I'm learning those things, being told what I should do about this environment to make, to make, to keep it uh, in a certain level of production so that I can continue to benefit. I've never had somebody telling me when I was young that do this in return for the environment. And I think that is what we missed. We need to start there. Now, as you raise your children, the ones that you're going to have in your, in your future, can you now start relating with these children and showing them how important the environment is? And I tell you that is the only, that is the only way or the only time that we are going to change how people react to the environment. Sometimes it becomes very hard to, to train an old dog uh, new tricks. But if you start with a small baby, how do they interact with the environment? How do they see you interacting with the environment? Do you unwrap a sweet and just throw your, your wrapping? Do you eat your, your maize and just uh, dispose of the, 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 the form just anywhere? So can we start being the role models as uh, young people? And I'm very happy for this this session because I want you the young people now that let's teach our children 
to be this kind and responsible towards the, the environment. And I'm very sure we are going to, to, to go somewhere. One thing I always like telling people is that values is everything in, in the environment and in the climate change uh, as uh, adaptation and mitigation. Do you value the environment? Uh, because I know even the, for the, for example, do we have some some taboos, some beliefs about the environment, for example. And this is where even the, the traditional uh, knowledge, the indigenous knowledge comes in. I'm sure some, most of us Africans, there are some things we cannot eat from the environment because, and you know, we might look at them as, as, as taboos, but I'm very sure that they, are, they contribute to the saving of the environment and also saving us because there are some things you cannot eat and therefore you're not going to interfere with the pathogens that are sleeping in the environment and bring them to the other human beings. So there are those things that we need to look at. They could be indigenous knowledge that we have in our society. And I would like to, to challenge anyone who is here who has uh, maybe who could be having their grandchildren, grandfathers, grandmothers who are a little bit el elderly to take it, to take uh, at, um, at this challenge, talk to them, let us document, you know, the traditional uh, knowledge that they have about the environment. Because at some point, we are going to lose these people. It is natural that we age and we, we die. Can we have some people who have documented our traditional knowledge that we, we, we had and put it, whether it is in English, Kiswahili, our traditional languages, just put it for us because one day, one time, we are going to miss this information because the, the carriers of the information will no longer be there. So that is a challenge to one of us who is here. We could do that. We can try and, and try and, and bring that information together and we keep on, on, on growing. Just like the way if you came from a blacksmith's family, you will keep on training a blacksmith in, in like that and like that or a herbalist. So can we have someone to keep for us that information somewhere? And it is a, it is it will be something good good for us. So as we talk about the youth engagement, I know Robert already said, and I'm going to repeat it again that we need to hear your voices, or we need to be heard. Can we come together as one voice? One thing I've noted is that uh, and Robert and the other people, uh, Jacob, I've seen Jacob is around here, is that political class is very hard to penetrate. And I, I hope Jacob, because he's still here, he's going to tell us how do we switch talk these policy, policy makers, the people in the government, because we do all this research. We have it in our books. We have it in our libraries. But it just looks like it is not getting to the right people, like it is not get, switching on the right, the right knob so that this can start rolling. I don't know, perhaps the, now the, the youth, the young people, can we come together as a, a bigger group and a bigger voice, understand these things, and front our, our agenda to the, to the political class? Because as much as we talk here, there are those policy makers, the political uh, people, the decision makers who have to buy our, our, our issues and do something about what we want to be done. Because one thing with the environment and climate change issues is because is that it doesn't the change is not seen by with tomorrow or the next day so it becomes very hard for you to convince somebody that if you cut this tree it's going to affect you so we have to we must get people and i don't know whether we have people who are in communication who should bring come up with good communication strategies on how to to capture the political class to be on our side as even as we fight the issues to do with climate change. Because issues to do with the climate change and business, when we advocate for climate uh, friendly strategies, there's someone else who is seen where you say that there's a river passing, I want to put up a mall. So how do we balance that and how do we fight or, uh, or have these people on our, on our side? How do we show them that if you construct on, on top of a spring, maybe the water will one day come and your, your, your construction will go down. Or if you do A, B, C, D, you are going to affect the environment. People are going to be sick. How we put value, value of the environment in terms of, of the economics that these people speak because they speak money, they speak bene benefits, they speak profit. So how do we show them that there's this profit in, in saving the environment. So we need to come up with a way of, of valuing our, our ecosystem services and presenting those, those values 
the, the, the figures to them. Of course, we have uh, people who are in, in the environmental economists who are able to do that, to, to, to value the, the natural resources or the ecosystem services. Like, for example, how do you value the oxygen, the clean oxygen that we breathe? Can we show them what would happen if you did not have clean oxygen? How many people will get sick in terms of the lungs and that? You know, you, you must communicate to these people in languages that they understand. So maybe one of us or all of us, we should come up with better ways of communicating our, our issues and showing the value, real value of environmental protection and conservation to the, to the people who are decision makers. So that, that's, that's my point. Okay, so well, yes, yes. continuously. Yes. Sorry, sorry for interrupting, but on the chat, there is um, a question from the economist. Uh, from where you see, you're aware uh, that we insti uh, instituted the Kenya National Adaptation Plan, that is 2015-2030, that aims to consolidate the country's vision on, adap on adaptation supported by mac macro level adaptation actions that relate to the economic sectors and county level vulnerabilities to enhance long-term resilience and adaptive capacity. Make some remarks on the progress kindly, if you have insights on that. On the chat, um, let me repeat. Yes, I'm you're being- reading. Ah, okay, sorry. Mm -hmm. That is to consolidate the country's vision on adaptation support by macro level adaptation actions that relate Okay, I th I think this uh, even as um, even Robert had, had had mentioned about it on the on the you know is it Robert or it's um, Mulati, Mulati or Bati? So I, I, this action you remember he said we have uh, the climate change action that is that is uh, in place 2018 2022 that we continue to to consolidate uh, all the adaptation all the adaptation uh, efforts that that we should put in place to 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 be able to fight uh, this climate change remember we have our ndcs uh, the national the nationally determined contributions that we are supposed to have by 2030 and one of the things is that we need to reduce our carbon emissions, our greenhouse uh, emissions. And therefore, I, I think it is still something in process. And most, uh, most government departments have come up with their own mainstreaming strategies for climate change mitigation and, and adaptation. And it is something that is, it is it's still being done. It is not a one day uh, thing and it goes. So we also we still have our contributions towards that, and uh, and one thing I would like us all of us to think about is um, or to bring on board. We could be having people here who are adapting in their own ways. I've seen people even adapting to climate change, but they are not very aware whether they are adapting to climate change. We need to consolidate these uh, adaptation measures and strategies that people are engaging in into a certain inventory and maybe front them to for upscaling you know people are doing small things in their areas but there are some things that are being done that can be upscaled even to the macro level the national level and as we said there's somebody who said that with with, with the climate change issues we think global but act local so but does not mean that what we are acting on the, in at our local areas cannot be uh, upscaled to the national uh, national level so it is something that is still going on. I don't know whether I have answered, but maybe as we go on, if I have not answered, maybe they can they can still yeah. ask something. So you the, will the, have, the last. Um, sorry, uh, you have a few minutes remaining, like two minutes. And if someone has questions, please write them on the chat. And uh, later on, we will have a, a slot for more questions and uh, closing remarks. Okay, continue, Wangeshi, two minutes. So, okay, so as I close, I was supposed also to talk about the urban farming, which I want to introduce to all the young people in this forum. I, we know that about urban farming. I'm very sure with this COVID-19, we've seen how urban farming has taken shape. 
An urban farming is now, is, I, I connect this with the SDG number 11, which is the sustainable cities and communities. So as much as we want to, 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 to have a sustainable nation, we need to think also how, of how people can adapt in the cities. And urban farming is one of the ways we can adapt to climate change. And the young people, I wanted just to front this as an idea that you could do urban farming, you could farm in the cities and still make money. I'm doing it myself and on my little scale, you could do it on your corridor. Even if you are not going to sell, I'm very sure that you, you make saving in terms of how much you, 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 you buy in terms of vegetables, in terms of eggs, you have a, if you have a small space for putting your, up your poultry. And therefore, I just wanted to front this one. I know there are so many adaptation strategies that people can engage in in the city, but one of the things that I've seen a bit, uh, which I've engaged with and I've liked and have loved is the urban farming. And it is, that is what I wanted to talk uh, about. But I think uh, as we move on, maybe we'll engage more even, uh, even after this forum. So there are so many ways, techniques, people are planting on the bottles, on the waste tires, on, you know, you're at your rooftop, on your car corridor, just try and do something to adapt to climate change because we know that any green space is very important for climate change uh, mitigation. And uh, therefore, I just ask you, what are you willing to give up for the environment or what are you doing for the environment? So just think about that as a young person. Thank you. Oh, perfect. Um, uh, we will have a breakout uh, session for like uh, five minutes. And then later on, we will have uh, Mr. Jacob Olonde. So um, I think someone from uh, Africa for SDGs will put us in the breakout groups. And as you can see, I've posted the questions there uh, for each group. So you have a quick discussion and then someone can present on it a few minutes later. Then Masil, uh, hold on to that question. You will be answered once we come back. Number, yes, number one. Number a little bit question number four question number four the question on how can we reduce rural to urban migration especially among young people through climate action that will change so just give us a few minutes okay so take okay. it on Paris. give us some four minutes some few minutes okay perfect then Wangeshi, you could answer to the question on the chat uh about the riparian land from mass field all right okay yeah we know that we are not supposed to build on the riparian areas and um, this uh, what what there is law we have the the national environmental management act that uh, the mpa uh, the anchor the national environment management and coordination act of the 1999 that gives the guidelines on how we supposed supposed to develop and how we are supposed to take care of our environment. And there is something that is called the environmental impact assessment that is supposed to be undertaken by any developer before you develop, uh, uh, you, you do your construction or your development for any project and for any program and for any project. The most unfortunate thing I think is, uh, and we've seen houses coming down, very big houses coming down. I think it goes back to our values, the issue of corruption, which falls squarely on all of us. We know that people want to get rich, people want to make quick money, and therefore they flout some of these rules. There's someone in office somewhere will be given a brown envelope and they just pass a project. But the law is there. It's not like we are not in short of, short of laws. We have a lot of policies and laws that help would help us manage our environment very well. And we also even know that we have the environmental court, land environment court that was created through the the, the climate law of 2015, that we, the climate act that we have. So I think it is not like we do not have laws, they are there, it is the enforcement. And enforcement also comes with the values and what we value most. So I don't know whether that is good. There is law under MCA 1999. Thank you. Wow. Those have been beautiful remarks and insightful points of view. And I think I've also learned a lot, given that I'm not an environmental expert. 
And uh, anyone else who had a question, probably, on the chat? Mm. Mm-hmm. Okay, I, I see someone who has on um, has a question. Is it uh, it's you, Paris? Okay, question three. Okay, we I have said that we have the laws and um and our education system. I see you asking about education system. I think currently we have the competence uh, competency based uh, curriculum, which I'm really hoping that as time goes on, is going to really put environment at the core of the the curriculum and uh, from what i see is that they are engaging the, the the children the young children in the environmental issues i've seen them uh, training them on how to compost for example to make some bio bio post uh, bio or humans uh, we have to, uh, i've seen them also teaching them how to clean the the cities and the streets so I think slowly our government and our education system is, is, is appreciating the importance of having our young people getting this, this information from a very tender age. So that you know what, what, what you consume uh, when you're young becomes your system, becomes you, becomes your habit, and, and it becomes your character. So if we train these children as young as they are from the, the zero grade, I think things might change in future. So I think the, the education system is doing something. The current one, the competency-based uh, curriculum that we, are, we that has been launched. So and we we hope to see a better tomorrow uh, from this. Akuri, I see your hand is up. You can ask your question. Akuri. Yes, my question is. Uh, what if, for example, a place when when sub when subdivision of the land was taking place, the, the, the area was not riparian, but later it turned out to be riparian. What will happen to the, the people who the the, the 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 water passes through their farms? Will they be affected in any way, or it will remain like that? Thank you. Okay, I. Uh, to answer you, I, I didn't know. I, I would like to say that you know the world was. You know we know how the earth was formed, and therefore there is no area that was not riparian. That we people just ignore. So if the the land had its its nature, the formation was there. So if the people who subdivided are the ones who ignored. The, the data, the scientific data that is there, for example, the geological uh, data, the hydrological data. So I do not think that the the the, the we are not hearing you, please. Hello. Okay. What I'm saying is that uh, it is it is not a matter of land changing, and those are things that I always come come across when I'm doing the EIS. It is not a matter of the land changing. It is a matter of us, the human beings, flaunting the laws of nature, not going through the data that is there for the geological, hydrological data that is there to understand the land, to understand the gradient, to understand the terrain. So there is no time that would say that the land has it was never at period and it has changed. We, it is us who did the opposite. So, and in that case, the law takes its, its course. And therefore, if you built on the riparian, I think there's nothing else that can be done. We just have to apply the law and someone has to move. Because if you fail to move, it is even a health hazard. It is even a hazard to you, a risk to the person who is living there. And as I said, Mother Nature does not forgive. If you're on riparian, one day the land will move. The landmass will move. You'll find yourself uh, buried somewhere. So let's all take this um, initiative. If, let us understand the laws and the policies that are there on environmental issues and climate change issues. Let's let's break them down to a, to a 
to be palatable to most of the people that are around because most of us might not be able to understand law or interpret law. Can we be able to, as the young people, take these laws, these guidelines, and try to make them as, as palatable as they can be to the common mwananchi? I think in that way we could be having, maybe there's an NGO here who represented here that does that, I am not sure, but maybe we could have some people, some of us breaking these guidelines because we have so many environments. In fact, I don't think there's any sector of the of this economy is highly regulated in, in like the, the environment, whether in Kenya or internationally. If you look at the international treaties that we have, we have more than 30 international treaties that, that talk about the environment and the climate. So can we look at this, all these treaties, which most of this, uh, our, our Kenyan government has ratified and see how we can break them down to be palatable to that businessman who is somewhere, that, that mother, the, the old woman somewhere who wants to, to put up some development. I think we'll be contributing to the economy if we are able to, 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 to create awareness and to train our, our people. On, on, on these uh, policies and um, laws in a very in a very easy language that they can be able to understand. That's what I can say. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry, my mic was off. So thank you for that presentation. Uh, we will now go to the breakout sessions and the question I've posted them on the chat. Uh, so accept the invites to go into the breakout session. You'll discuss the questions and then one person will make a small presentation. You'll have like five to 10 minutes. So to stop, but Africa first, did you someone?
Okay, welcome back. As we wait for the others to come back into the main session, um, I'm sure you've had a wonderful discussion uh, with your teammates and uh, probably we could start with uh, the first group. Do you have a representative? I post the questions again. Hello, Paris. Hello. Uh, group four had a challenge of network, so we never discussed. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, yeah, but uh, maybe the leader who wanted to write will say something, but it was a, a challenge. We could not hear each other. Mm. Okay, I think you can just um, give your insights. One of you can volunteer to just give insights on behalf of the group. So you'll have each uh, five minutes, but if you take less minutes, we will appreciate so that we can have uh, uh, our next speaker after this uh, session, Jacob. Okay, Cecilia will say something on our behalf, I hope so. Okay. Um, on the first question, we our answer was, uh, these groups need to consolidate agenda and work together as a block. Uh, so we were heading to question two when technical error appeared. Thank you. Wow, nice. Um, group two or any other contribution from your group member? Uh, are you done with group one? Group, group one? one? Elisheba, do you have something to add? I, I didn't even get the second part of the question. That's where the problem now arose. I don't know what it was. It was how can youth in your communities engage in climate action and benefit in one way or another? Because most people, as you know, people ask what's in it for me, you know? I, I think as we uh, have been listening to all the youth speak, and uh, now we are talking about climate change. Uh, and the last speaker talked about um, uh, the, the, what? Uh, something on cities, the urban cities, the urban farming. I think the youth can start in their areas on doing this. I, in our, NGO, we have youth who are doing the hanging gardens. They are doing the hanging, hanging gardens in where they stay. We have the youth working partly, given opposite, and in a, a, a chance to work in a school to come up with, a, with a farming, so that even when the schools come back, maybe they'll have something. So there's a lot to be done by the youth within their environment. And I'm happy that the youth are being told, start where you are and start small and grow up. So that is very important. Starting small, growing and using the space you have to make a change in the climate and improve it. Thank you. Okay, and um, for group two, uh, um, yes. Uh, I think there's a confusion. Uh, she was she answered yes our question, but uh, could we maybe answer our question because you're from group one, she's from group four. Ah, okay. Oh, I'm from group four. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay, but thank you. You yeah, actually did work. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, so yeah, she mentioned yeah some points we uh, also indicated in our group. Um, the technology and innovations that people are engaging in to reduce uh, maybe carbon footprint or plastic wastage in uh, or plastic pollution in the environment. So yeah, we mentioned uh, innovations you could come up with um, to work on that. As well, you can engage in community cleanup exercises or tree planting, such voluntary activities. Um, other ways you could engage, uh, you can do it at home. 
there's a there's a community if so to call it or an organization called green thing kenya they produce everything non-plastic from toothbrush to uh, toothpaste literally anything um uh, kitchen towels you stop using the normal paper towels you instead use a cotton cloth uh, so yeah you can just take like baby steps to just be the change you want to see in the climate uh, action yeah basically those are uh, most of the points you discussed well nice thank you for that um group two a representative hello my name is ife from access education international and for group two we were discussing the question what's the connectivity between climate action and circular economy we started by defining climate action and circular economy climate action means stepped up efforts to reduce you, greenhouse uh, sorry will you kindly switch on your video when you're talking so that we can see you thank you i'm sorry my, my video is my camera has like an issue so i can't turn ah, on okay. the camera it's okay go on yeah so climate action means stepped up efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and circular economy is an economic system which is aimed at eliminating waste and it employs the using repairing recycling and remanufacturing so the connectivity between them is that they are they are tied when people usually think about climate action, we think about planting trees and we forget about the plastic revolution. However, we should incorporate the circular economy whereby we reuse, reduce, recycle and repair. And we need to make something out of the waste. So if anyone else has something to add from group two, I think we're done. Yeah, yeah, maybe just to add, we also said we rethink. Before you use anything that uh, spoils the environment or spoils the climate or anywhere you stay, rethink about it. Just rethink. And if you, in one way or the other, something has not worked very well over time, then repair that. Thank you. Nice. Group three. Uh, group three, we're dealing with what policies. Uh -huh. have... I can't see you. <laughs> uh, let me check if my camera is okay. Okay, go on. So we were looking at uh, what policies do we have in Kenya and Africa on matters climate change, and uh, if we, I think, education system support climate change comprehensively. So we said that um, in Kenya, um, uh, regarding issues of policies, that uh, 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 to start with is that policies, um, we, we, we have policies that have not yet, um, you know, we are always on the drawing board, but we are not implementing these policies. We have several, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, policies regarding uh, climate change, but we have not reached at a point of implementing the policies change comprehensively. Uh, uh, for instance, we have had um, a policy on issue of um, paper bags, um, uh, the, 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 the polythene paper bags, but you see the implementation, the government started, but you go back on the in the market, you will find it is all, um, it is everywhere. So the implementation bit of policies is lacking in one way or, or, or the other, which we feel that are still um, are the government agencies in um, uh, concerned with the policy implementation uh, or rather implementing those policies that have been set uh, apart should play its major role to ensure that these um, 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 uh, uh, policies on climate change are adhered to and it should be taken with seriousness that this is not a matter of just joking. We also realize that uh, corruption has also been a big hindrance in uh, implementation of some of these policies, which um, uh, uh, unfortunately is very sad for our country. 
unlike other countries, we are seeing that um, uh, um, uh, different uh, uh, countries like Western countries and even Asian countries um, have uh, they have systematic way of implementing um, uh, uh, such policies, which um, uh, is very very. Uh, uh, you know, positive as far as policies is concerned. We also looked at, um, we also, um, uh, I uh, discussed that we need also to encourage local innovation um, uh, uh, to, to, to th they should be, you know, um, uh, brought into, into, into perspective to be able to um, uh, help with, um, you know, uh, 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 matters regarding uh, climate change. So um, uh, uh, this um, intertwined together would be able to uh, uh, help us to be somewhere. In uh, As far as education is concerned, we have uh, discussed and said that um, uh, our curriculum has been um, uh, the biggest challenge in implementations of matters regarding climate change. Uh, a curriculum that is based on theory and uh, you know um, a rote learning um, approach, whereby students only think of I go to class to cram uh, whatever the teacher has taught me, do the exams and walk out of the class. That one has been a big challenge to climate um, uh, change in education system, which we discuss and say that uh, there is a need for um, uh, 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 education system and our curriculum at large to approach the issue of climate change from a practical base uh, um, uh, um, approach and uh, incorporate students to be able and, and, and the, uh, the children in school uh, system to be able to uh, you know, participate on areas of climate change so that uh, it doesn't um, just end up with I am doing exams. We need to see um, children being involved in things like, um, you know, um, a little bit of uh, community-based programs where they can know and be part and parcel of them that it is our responsibility to make our environment better. And it is not just because we are doing it for examination, we are not just doing it for the teacher, but this what we are doing is a matter of life and death tomorrow, because it defines our environment, it defines our country, it defines us as a person, uh, as a student in the, in, the, in the long run. And we feel that if the, it can be approached from that basis, we will be able to um, see students personalizing some of these um, uh, climate um, climate issues, and I feel that we have uh, felt that um, uh, together with other things that we have added. Like um, another uh, gentleman was telling us, like in is in China, and uh, the approach there is totally different from uh, the way we approach in Kenya, uh, whereby he has to keep track of if he, he buys something or the water that he's using, he has to keep track, he has to pay for it to be in, uh, to ensure that um, um, uh, uh, issues of climate change is uh, being looked into. So we feel that the very approach should also be given to our education system, uh, incorporated in our curriculum and be implemented. I would also welcome our, um, our, our members. There is something I have forgotten probably to help me out. I think you have highlighted uh, all the points uh, inclusively, so that's okay. Um, group number okay, four. One? Ah, okay, you can add. Okay, thank you very much. I was in that group, and I will just add uh, an issue of accountability because the other people <coughs> policies are there to the the guiding principles of everything that we that should be done on on a given area of land. So this needs to be accounted for in each and every part of the, like on every action of us. For example, those people whom we have entrusted with, with the implementation and of, of these policies in into the daily activities, like for example, let's say uh, NEMA and all those, if they don't do that, this cutting of link between the, the people and, and also the action that should be taken. So they, 
I think the issue of accountability should be also be taken care of and it should be something that is very serious dealt with. Thank you. Okay. Um, the next group, number four, uh, you have five minutes. If you take less minutes, I appreciate. Um, group four, I think, is the one which you started instead of group one. Ah, uh, okay. Perfect. Okay, we go to group five. Hello. Yes. My name is Nancy. I'm going to present for group five. Yes, go ahead. Hello. Um, my yes. name is Nancy. I'm going to present for group five. So our question was on uh, what's the degree of effect of climate action in agriculture in Africa and how can we go around it? Uh, we had, uh, we didn't have enough much time, but I managed to write a few points myself together with the ones that were added. So I'll add quickly, uh, let me go so the, the first thing is we maintain pandemic, um, we, you, you, you have come to see that uh, most of the people have now. Is the speaker clear? Um, I can't really hear him clearly, but if it's an issue, you can just switch on your, your video and just speak. And you need to be a bit fast, okay? Okay, the question, we were tackling the question on the degree of effect of climate action in agriculture in Africa and how we can go around it. So the first point, amid the COVID-19 pandemic, everyone's focus, especially those who lost their jobs, uh, they, they shifted to agriculture as uh, a basic can you hold your mic in place, please? Hello, can you hear me? Just hold your mic in one position and just speak from there. Yes. I'm saying the first point was amid the We can't hear you. There's a lot of background noise. Can you get me? Yes, go on. Okay. So as I was saying, uh, after uh, amid the COVID-19 pandemic, yes. everyone's mind uh, uh, shifted to agriculture as we can all uh, attest to. So most, uh, Um, Kentry, we seem to be losing you. Hello? Hello, continue. Okay, as I was saying, after the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic hit us, uh, most, of, most of us, uh, our minds shifted to towards agriculture. Uh, so like, there was more product, more, 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 more. Like we, um, we could see, we could see uh, teachers, uh, probably actors, and everyone from every sector of uh, of the of each industry. Most of them are now focused on uh, agriculture. So upon the shift uh, in agriculture, we have we, we, we can attest that there has been a, there has been a, a more economical friendly uh, 
climate Kenfrey, we need you to be a bit fast with the presentation. Okay. Is there a member of the group who can also help? Because he seems to be having difficulties with the with the internet. Someone from the group to step in. Someone else from the group to step in? Okay. Hello. Hello, we seem to be losing you. Is it possible then for you to type for us the, the points on the chart? Sorry about that. Okay. After the, after the introduction of, uh, after the, the Upon taking over of the agriculture, uh, amid the, the COVID-19 pandemic. You have two have, minutes, so be quick. Uh -huh. We have clearly seen that uh, this shift has led to a more climate effective, climate, climate effective. There is, I, I suggest uh, we I think, just the group just go. Okay, so I think what we do is we continue and the group members, you can write those points down. Uh, we will go directly to Jacob Olonde, the executive director of ECAS Institute, and he's also an environmental law and policy expert. Please, you're welcome. The stage is yours. Many minutes. Uh, you can take 20 minutes. Oh, 20 minutes. Please uh, allow me to share my screen. Okay, the host. <clears throat> Activate Jacobs. Uh, allow him to present. You may proceed. Okay. Is my screen visible? Yes, it is. So you don't need to see me. Okay. Uh, if we can see you, the better. So. Uh, I would want to those who are able to to see the screen to see the screen because. My presentation is a summary of uh, all the presentations. Now that I'm the final uh, presenter, I've uh, been forced to, to use a new, uh, uh, to modify my, my presentation to at least offer a summary of uh, the previous presentation. So as mentioned, I'm also a researcher at the Institute for Climate Change Adaptation at the University of Nairobi. So um, I happen to eat climate change. Uh, what we are going to do is uh, learn. So uh, the previous presenters, I'm just going to fill the gaps. Okay, let me say that. I'm going to fill the gaps in knowledge from the previous presenters. So uh, they define climate change as change in the state of the climate that persists for an extended period, usually decades or longer. And uh, that's a belief that all of us know what weather is, that it's a day-to-day -day variation in the climate parameters of, uh, of humidity, temperature, uh, wind, and, uh, and the rest, then that introduces us to climate. To climate is the average weather condition. So weather is day to day, climate is the average of weather. So then that brings us to climate change. So as these weather parameters change, then that brings about climate change. And uh, we are told that uh, a little bit of climate science is that uh, there are some things which you need to know 
uh, even as you talk about climate change. I'm doing this because a number of us from your responses since morning is informing me that we have not really laid a foundation on what climate change is. So climate change is the uh, is the way is the variation in climate over a period of time, and this variation is caused is influenced by a number of uh, by a number of uh, factors. One is the atmosphere, atmosphere, the hydrosphere, which is the liquid water, cryosphere, which is the ice and snow, and then we have the lithosphere, which is rock and soil, then the biosphere, which is made up of plants animals, which, is, which includes humans. And then we we'll also need to know that Earth's climate is influenced by the amount of energy and the focus on climate change, all the debates around energy. This explains why we focus much on energy, which is the solar radiation, including the amount of greenhouse gases and aerosols in the atmosphere. So that introduces us to the concept of the greenhouse gas effect. The greenhouse gas effect, if you can see me, the way I'm presenting it is, uh, I don't know whether you can see me. Uh, let me see. Uh, are you able to see the screen? Yeah. Yes. So, The concept of greenhouse gas is about, oh, it, it's not. Yes. You are able to see the screen? Yes, we are. Yes. So, as you can see, the greenhouse gas concept, because people are asking what is greenhouse gas, global warming, climate change, it is all to me the same thing, but explained differently. So greenhouse gas effect is whereby the sun's radiation hits the ground. And then as it hits the ground, you are taught in geography that it's the, the heat needs to, to go up back into the space. But because of the, of the, uh, the, because of the greenhouse gases at the, on, on the atmosphere, then these gases, are, this heat is retained up. And when it is retained, so instead of going up into the atmosphere, it's retained. And when that is retained, then it, the, it warms the earth. So as it warms the earth, then that one causes the variation in temperatures. So you find some places are warmer, some places are cooler. So that is the impact, is the effect of greenhouse gas. And that's well explained if you can able to see what causes climate change. Climate change is caused by natural variations. Uh, sometimes we're told that the moon goes around the sun or the sun, the earth goes around the, the sun. So that those variations causes uh, variations in climate, in, in climate. Then volcanic eruptions, then we have the human activity which is the key cause of climate change. As you can be able to see, uh, some of the little simple activities which we undertake on our daily to day day to day uh, living includes overstocking. Kenya is Yolo. If you go to Yolo, if you go to northern Kenya, if you go to Masai land, you will see what we are talking about. Too many cows. Then we have forest fires. We have like now the Savo is burning. We have fossil fuel food. People cutting down trees. We have charcoal. We have urban energy. We have landslides, we have urban challenges, we have soil erosion. Now, what are the sources of greenhouse gases? One is carbon dioxide. Number two is methane, which is found mainly in coal and natural gas and trash. So trash, the reason why you are told people are living around Andorra are having issues is because of the methane, uh, which is one of the gases being emitted from the landfill. Then we have nitrous oxide, which is mainly found in fertilizers and is on certain industrial manufacturing and combustion. We have chlorofluoro uh, CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, or hydrochloro hydrochlorofluorocarbons, or hydrofluorocarbons, or perfluorocarbons, sulfur electrocytes, and the rest, which are used in industries, commercial, and household products. So those are the sources of greenhouse gases. Simple carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and CFCs. Now, 
you know the carbon circle, which I'm not going to go to because of time. Now, what are the ob observed effects of climate change? Climate change has already resulted in sea level rising. If you go to Mombasa, you'll be told that uh, uh, this thing for Jesus was like too far away from the waters, but now the water is visiting it every day, or actually it's not part, part of history in the water. So we have Arctic sea ice it's melting. If you can watch online, you'll see glaciers and permafrost, sea, sea surface temperatures are warming, the temperatures of lake, lake, large lakes are warming, heavy rainfall, crops are withering, extreme drought is increasing, ecosystems are changing, hurricanes, frequent heat waves, warmer temperatures affecting human health, and seawater is becoming more acidic. As you can see from the on the screen, temperature rising, increase in sea level, loss of snow cover, and uh, uh, this is just a, a virtual representation. Now, regionally, what are the impacts of climate change? One, we have seen even in your rural areas, you'll be able to know that the river you used to bathe in when you are young is no longer there, or if it's there, then it is seasonal. So rivers are becoming more seasonal, disappearing altogether, then the sea level changes, shrinking of lake levels and sizes, biodiversity loss, shifts in rainfall seasons, the resurgence of some sea diseases and environmental degradation, among others. Now, if you can watch this, you'll nearly understand that Lake Chad is almost dying, it's almost disappearing. And Lake Turkana, the size of Lake Turkana is also going down. And with that, you also understand that drying of lakes and uh, that Lake Nakuru is also shrinking. And also that Kilimanjaro, uh, the mountain glaciers on Kilimanjaro is already in Mibaki Kidogo too. Uh, even when you also understand the temperatures in uh, Masabit, you also understand the deep variation. The temperatures are in, 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 in rising uh, exponentially. Now, what are the impacts of climate change on development? One, the challenge in that there is poverty. 1.3 billion people live on less than $1 per day and 3 billion people on less than $2 per day. That one tells you that we have a problem. The poverty levels are increasing. However much we talk about the GDP, but we are, well, those who are going to school uh, understand that GDP is not a good measure of, of development. And then we have food, food issues that Robert mentioned that there's going to be an increasing, uh, increasing elements of food insecurity where 800 million people are already malnourished, that they are eating, but they're not eating quality food. Water, 1.3 billion people without, are living without clean water with 2 billion without sanitation. We have energy, 2 billion people without electricity. Uh, already Kenya is trying with the last mile uh, but there are still so many rural areas where there's no electricity. In the environment, 1.4 billion people ex are exposed to dangerous levels of outdoor pollution and largely exposed to indoor air pollution and vector bomb diseases. And shelter-wise, we, we, uh, we know due to civil strife and degradation, natural disasters, there are this thing called climate-induced uh, conflicts, which are resulting in uh, migration and increase in the numbers of refugees. What are the responses? The responses to climate change include adaptation. Adaptation is the adjustments we do, we make to live with the changing climate. Then we have mitigation, which is what actions being undertaken to reduce or prevent emission of greenhouse gases. Remember, adaptation is saying climate change is here, what do we do to live with it? But mitigation is saying, yes, it is here, but we need to, to stop it. And what to stop it is to minimize or limit or prevent emission of greenhouse gases. Then we have the climate finance, which is an enabler. And the climate finance is, is, is just money is drawn from public, private, or alternative sources of financing uh, uh, towards addressing climate change. Then we have the technological transfer, which is just the use of technology to address climate change through adaptation. Or mitigation. Uh, strategic issues in talking about climate change. One, we have vulnerabilities, which I've already explained. We have emissions, more so agriculture is the leading emitter. And then we have 
have a lack of account. It's very difficult to understand, to know what, uh, what we are producing, what we are emitting. It's a, it's a technical concept. Then we have inadequate policy and weak regulatory frameworks and overlap of mandates among institutions. You will know in all the ministries, there are desks, climate change desks, and uh, all these desks or uh, focal points. Uh, you'll not, you'll, so many people don't understand how NEMA is a focal point, how treasury, the role of NEMA, the role of treasury, the name of the role of Ministry of Environment, the role of climate change directorate, the, the role of, uh, of uh, Kenya Meteorological Department, all these. So that conflicting uh, in roles is, is really impacting. I saw a question on the, uh, on the platform on which policies are existing in Kenya toward climate change. One, we have the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change in the 1992. We have the Paris Agreement, the 2015. We have the African Climate Change Strategy. We have the East Africa Climate Change Policy Framework and Strategy. We have National Climate Change Response Strategy 2010, which Julius mentioned. Uh, National Adaptation Plan 2015 mentioned that. Sorry for that. National Climate Change Act 2016 and National Determined Contribution, the NDC, which Kenya uh, did in response to the Paris Agreement. Then we have the MCA, the reviewed MCA 2016, and then National Climate Change Action Plan 2018-2022. We have the CIDPs, County Integrated Development Plans. Then we have the annual development plans, which are the uh, tools towards implementing the CIDP. So CIDPs are just are visionary, but they are implemented through CIDPs or annual development plans. Now, uh, I'm, I tend to focus on Climate Change Act because this is the, the legal framework that all of us must anchor our actions on. One, it is an act of parliament that provides legal and institutional framework for the mitigation and adaptation to the effects of climate change. So it just facilitates responses and provides guidance and measures. It's a policy, it offers policy coordination and oversight, as I mentioned that, and financial provisions. Now, uh, objects of Climate Change Act. Why Climate Change Act? Climate Change Act 2016 is there to support Kenya in seeking to achieve low carbon climate resilient development. It's supposed to mainstream climate change response in development planning. So it supports building resilience and enhancing adaptive capacity, provide incentives and obligation for private sector participation, facilitate meaningful public participation, and then mainstream the principle of sustainable development into planning, mainstream and enforce climate change disaster risk reduction into strategies and actions, and finally, to mainstream intergenerational and gender equity. I'm, I'm not happy because since morning, people, nobody has really mentioned the role of gender, the role of women in climate action. But it's OK, because the, the moderator is a lady, so all is well. Role of county government, role of county governments in climate change action in Kenya. Because everybody is focused on national level, but very few people, uh, my friend Kioli, uh, it's called, I've forgotten his name, he's in this, he, he's a participant here, he's in Makweni and he's re doing a lot of things at the county level. So what's the role of county government in all this? Climate change is addressed as a shared responsibility between the national and county government. So it's a shared responsibility. It's not saying, oh, climate change is only for the national government or for county government. It's a shared responsibility. The law, because schedule for the constitution, says that the national government has got a responsibility to build capacity of, and enable county governments to develop policies. Oh, no, the role of national government is to develop policies and build capacity of county government to implement those policies. So the role of county government is to implement policies and at the same time enhance their capacity and capability to enforce such uh, the laws and also uh, domesticate some of these national uh, frameworks. Also, the law seeks to utilize CIDPs as a tool through which the NCAP can be mainstreamed with, within counties' context. So, CIDPs are offering us, are acting as tools to the implementation of NCAP. What are the issues? 
we have issues which uh, are impacting on climate change action in Kenya. One, we have inadequate capacities and weak coordination. We have inadequate financing of activities. We, we can never have enough money. But the question we ask, what have we done with what we already have? Then inadequate capacity and weak coordination, I think I mentioned that, limited human resource capacity to participate in climate change activities, limited research, technology development and innovation. Just as we mentioned in our, in, in our subgroup is that we have technologies, but they are expensive, they are technical, and majority of us are not able to understand. And there's a, a documentary which was done last week, an article, I think, last month, that innovators, most of innovations in Kenya are, are owned by expatriates. I don't know how to call them, but there are international companies registered somewhere, but they come work in Kenya, so they bid and get big money, and the local innovators are not able to compete. So that's an issue, then inadequate data and information on climate change in Kenya. So what we talk about is localized, because I, as I saw some the economists, the economists, you'll understand that it is so difficult to quantify climate change impacts. Even the world, even UN, is a struggle to know this is the cost of climate change. This is as it happened. This disaster has happened as a result of climate change, and it has caused this. So that's a, a still a gray area. And uh, uh, in terms of actions, the national government is supposed to integrate climate change action plan into several strategies. All government ministries they are supposed to to mainstream climate change into their plans. Then they are supposed to report on greenhouse gas emissions and, and uh, regularly monitor and review the performance of the integrated climate change functions. So it is not the core responsibility of the Ministry of Environment. All the government departments are responsible for climate change. For the counties, they are supposed to mainstream climate change actions interventions into their CIDPs and annual development plans. And then they're supposed to develop updates, CIDPs, every CIDPs are updated after five years. Uh, county governments may enact legislations that defines implementation, so they are also allowed to, to enact legislations. And I remember there are so many counties which have already done, developed uh, climate finance regulations, their climate change response strategies uh, by different counties. Uh, or we have so many stakeholders involved in climate change. We have the one nine inches, just individuals doing their own things. We have development partners, we have private sector, CAM, CAPSA, they have climate change departments. We are very strong and influencing actions. Then we have the media, we have governments, we have academia, we have CSOs, FB, FBOs, the faith-based organizations. Nowadays, there are so many churches, so many religions, even the Muslim, even the Hindus that are engaging in climate change actions. So what do we need to, need to do as young people? What we need to do as young people is one, we need to train ourselves. You know, getting a degree, you go, you do climate change as a unit, that should not be enough because we, you, you tend to understand, I work with young people and you tend, they tend to confuse environment and climate change and very few people really understand what this really climate change is, that you can isolate it from the rest of uh, biodiversity laws and, uh, and the, the marine, uh, some of the related topics. So you can say, this is what we are talking about. So then you go for advocacy meetings in the ministry or in UNEP or UN, you become an informed participant. So train yourself, learn more, and then engage in local efforts. We are told, think globally, but act locally. Know and understand the policy and legislative framework. Until you read, you take this policy and legislative frameworks and read and understand, you will not influence much. So even as we talk, please get the laws, get the policies, read, so that when you engage somebody, you, you engage from an informed position. You need to visit and engage relevant institutions. I usually ask my mentees, do you even know where UNEP is? Ah, you know, do you know where the Ministry of Environment is? I don't know. Do you know where NEMA is? I know because so many of us after campus, we run to NEMA to get our EIA uh, license. But what after that? So then we need to engage in research to back your advocacy actions, research. 
please get to engage in research, if not possible, read the research reports so that you don't be a, you don't be a desktop or boardroom uh, young person who talk about I had, I had, you know, or always on phone, get to understand what is happening because climate is changing, things are changing. What you saw last month uh, in terms of climate change impact is totally different from what is it on the ground now. So update yourself on climate change issues, then take personal action to address climate change, personal action. Please, as one of us mentioned, no waste. Unnecessary driving around, you can carpool and the rest of them. Then work as a group, mobilize. Somebody said, how can young people work as groups? You work with open-minded people. Don't just think that 100 people will do enough. Even two people is a, is a group because sometimes people are different. And I will tell you, that you, as much as you, leave, you need to leave no one behind, don't be dragged back or down by people whose vision contradicts yours. Be creative, finally, innovative. We can talk about all this, but by the end of the day, you are going to sleep somewhere. You need rent, you need everything. Young people, I tell you, innovate, be self-reliant, go green, create climate smart jobs. In all these ideas, sit down, register a company somewhere, register an organization, live your life, pay your own rent, be self-reliant. Going out for demonstrations, 100 people, we went demonstrated, and at long last after the demonstration, you'll be given 500 shillings. That will not sustain your life in Nairobi. Be creative. Read about climate change, see what you can pick out of it and live your life, feed your families, and at the same time, contribute to conservation of nature and also adaptation through adaptation of mitigation. Finally, in conclusion, climate change impacts have the potential to undermine and even and, and, and do progress made in improving the social climate change vulnerability communities. What I'm saying is that it doesn't matter what we're doing now. If you don't talk about climate change, nothing, no amount of money in development will change our lives. There is need to focus on reducing the risks associated with the current climate variability and the extremes in order to be able to adapt to future changes in climate. So we are talking about vulnerability, the risks. The one risk is poverty. We need to uplift the livelihoods to the lives by uh, adopting climate smart lively, livelihoods, both in urban, as our presenter mentioned, the urban farms. We need to understand that concept, see what we can do, go do it back somewhere so that so many people can be able to earn a living out of climate change action. And with that, I will say thank you. I hope I'm within time. Yes, yes, you are within time. And I don't know if someone has a question, uh, but um, I will have a question for you because most times we talk about climate change and all these things. And then we realize as African countries, so to say, and the Asian, we hardly pollute. Let me say we hardly pollute. And here we are talking about industrialization. We need to grow. We need to to have um, uh, jobs and you know improve infrastructure and everything. So a question will come in, where would we adopt um, this, all these measures to combat climate change, yet we are not polluting as much? And at the same time, where would other countries, let's say the advanced countries, ask us as African countries, not to mine something like coal because it will pollute the environment, yet it's the same basis under which that they use to grow their economies. What would you tell someone who comes off to you with that kind of perception? Let me ask you a question, a very simple question that I wish I asked somewhere in terms of meeting and people felt I was mad. When your dad tells you that he met your mom in a, in a disco matanga, <laughs> And then uh, you, you, you are a disco, you just want to go dancing everywhere. And your dad tells you, yeah, my daughter, you know, from my experience, please stop going, stop. And you say, no, no, daddy. But what he saw, that is the status 
the current global status. That these guys are telling us, we did this. But you see, it, is, it was not the good path. Yes, we have developed, but as you develop, you need to, mod, to moderate. You don't need to take the old path. So what, they, what are they doing? They are doing, they are supporting the, the, uh, the differentiation that Robert talked about. That we have equal responsibility, but we are different, we are different in our approaches. We all need to develop. So as much as they polluted, now we have technologies that are going to have already enabling us to develop without going the cold way. So there are options, there are alternatives to the old ways. What's so difficult? What we need to talk about and as Africans is that please, when you give us money, don't give us money in terms of loans. Don't give climate finance in form of loans because that's taking us back. Give us in terms of grants so that we can, uh, we can develop to reach where you have reached. But we can't talk about who did what and who is big because climate change, you remember in 92, uh, a good example, no, let, let me just use this, uh, this bird which went to CIA and went and died in CIA from Europe. I don't know from where, you see. That's how climate change is. It happens somewhere, but, affect, but affects. It is global in nature, but local in impact. So that should be our understanding that as much as we want to, to deny responsibility, we are in this for life and death. Perfect. Anyone else with a question? Thank you for answering my question. <laughs> Anyone with a question or curiosity, something? Okay. I think you, you've really taken us through the, 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 the nitty gritties of um, climate and uh, all that there is to know about also policy and implementation. And from your presentation, what I understand is we need to have a more hands-on approach than just drawing things on blueprints and papers and you know structuring laws. We can implement what is already there, what already exists before going back to the drawing tables and modifying and bringing in new laws and acts and those kind of things. So I would want to know, is it possible for you to share your presentation um, with us? <laughs> like on email? Yeah. It's really possible. There's a question I, will, I, don't, I really wanted to talk about, but I think Julia has mentioned it. Oh, okay, the adaptation you can go plans. Ahead. And yes. to our new food population for enhanced climate resilience towards environmental emission, 10 to 30 and beyond. I will tell the economist and the, the rest of us that when we talk about climate change, we must shift. So many young people, I actually wanted to shift my presentation from this, from climate change to mentorship, to leadership, climate leadership or environmental leadership. When we talk about all this, the problem is that we have the we mentality that somebody somewhere needs to work, but it is you. It is you who will be impacted. It is your close family, like COVID. It is, it, we are on our own now. That's how climate change is. So even as we talk about policies, I've mentioned that we have all the laws we need on climate change in Kenya, but we still have challenges on implementation. How do we implement these policies? Which means that implementation is, is about personality, individuals, is about goodwill. If we have political goodwill, all will well, all will do well. If we don't have, those things will just be in the shelves somewhere waiting for funding, which might not come. So let's take it upon ourselves as young people to train ourselves about climate change and understand very well what we need. And if possible, get a mentor, somebody who can direct your path to be able to, so that you'll be able to contribute meaningfully to climate, to climate action. Thank you. Wow, perfect. 
you've summed it up more or less the, the same way um, a former, uh, let's call her uh, a Nobel Peace Prize uh, uh, laureate, a former Nobel Peace Prize winner, Wangari Matai had said, you know, you cannot, you cannot protect the environment unless you empower people. You inform them and you help them understand that these are their resources, they are their own and they must protect them. So it's the little things that we as people and citizens do that will make the difference. And for, for, he, for her, it was planting the trees. You know, that was her difference. So what is our difference? What are we contributing? If it's in policy, are you seeing the policies up to the implementation, you know? At your individual level, what are you doing? Let's not talk about the government. Let's not talk about the multinational bodies and corporations and everything. What are you doing at an individual level? Yeah, because if, if, if there are no, I think some messages, but uh, on individual, we have a friend of my mind called Claire Nasike. I don't know whether you have met her somewhere. Claire Nasike, her focus on is on food security. She has just picked that and she's talking about food safety, fertilizers. So you see, that one contribute to climate action, but at the same time, she has chosen her path. She has been chosen to be an expert in that. I have another mentee of mine called Eric. Eric has just a Nimutua Miti too. But nowadays he's talking about air quality. We have, there's another mentee of mine here. For him, it's biodiversity. Uh, it's called Wafula. But so young people choose what you are good in and put all your energy. For me, it is all about training, the, just talking to young people and research and that. So, and talking about policy issues and, and law. Choose your area. Don't be a jack of every, you know, you see a young person in a t-shirt, today is wildlife, Till tomorrow they are running about you. Today is waste, today is, no, no, no. You will be wasted. By the time you are marrying in this city, you will be surviving. So for now, if you are still single, please channel your energy to a course. I'm seeing a question by Edson. The National Treasury in some times back was developing budgeting codes for climate change financing for easy tracking on the said budget as well to have. Uh, I think uh, from, my, from my understanding, that's work still in progress. And uh, we are still, actually we are supposed to be having a meeting on uh, climate finance tracking tool, uh, which the CSOs and private sector were invited to comment on. So Edson, uh, I, I think I should be sharing with you after this, uh, the draft uh, uh, tool, so that you can also be able to brief yourself. If possible, you can, you can send your, your comments to, to climate change directorate. Nice. Um... Any Is more contributions? We can't hear you. Repeat, please. Jacob? No, I, I was inviting you to take over. Uh, OK. Thank you very much for the wonderful okay. presentation. Uh, we've really enjoyed the presentations uh, from uh, Robert Mutami to Dr. Monica and now uh, from you, Jacob. We've really... Oh, sorry, sorry, my mic was a bit on mute. So um, I'll want to say, you know, we've had a great time from uh, talking about the different effects uh, with relation to climate change from Dr. Uh, Monica to Robert to now Jacob. And probably if one of you has something they would want to add before we go to the closing remarks, um, you're welcome, the floor is yours. Jacob or Dr. Monica or Robert. I had also seen Julius make, make uh, several contributions. Maybe if he has something, he can also say. And so uh, today's session uh, was also live. 
on Facebook. So you can actually follow um, on, on, on the Facebook uh, at Africa for SDGs. And tomorrow we will have a talk on youth and passion and talent. And I hope all of you can uh, get some time to join us. And with this, um, it's been great being your moderator for this session. Uh, I've also learned a lot through these sessions and I've understood that we also need to study and uh, read, like be informed because most of us have the knowledge, but we don't know what to do with the knowledge. So with that said, I would like to invite uh, one of the persons from uh, the uh, Africa for SDGs uh, to take over from here. Thank you for your time. Awesome, awesome. So guys, thank you so much. Just to appreciate Paris, just go to the reactions uh, tab or and click reactions. You can give a thumbs up or clap your hand. And uh, thank you very so much for your time. Thank you again. So guys, I'm waiting for the reactions just to show we are together in this. Tomorrow we shall have a prominent guys, shall have um, E. Danganga. We shall have Victor Mbuvi Kwata Kawaya on board. We shall have uh, Demola. We have Kadzo, we have Bowser, Jacob Bayo, and Ramona. And then, of course, our moderator for tomorrow. So please just give those reactions. Uh, and that, I don't know from the other side, do you have any comments in terms of technical uh, aspects of this? Ndati? Okay, thank you, guys. It was nice having you today. See you tomorrow, invite your friends. In case you missed it, just share the link through Facebook page. Just take that link and share. Have a blast, blast afternoon. Asante Nisana. Paris, do you have anything to say for us? Um, maybe I will see you tomorrow in the next session. And if you have any doubts or anything you want clarified, feel free to write to Africa for SDGs. And if you have any propositions or any comments, uh, regarding the sessions and what you would also like to see uh, improved or personalized questions that you'd want answered, I think you can reach out to Africa for SDGs. And you know, happy International Youth Day. And thank you for joining us for these sessions. And before we go, let's just have one minute for Katile Mutuku, the CEO of uh, Youth Barriers for Change, just to say hi to us and then we call it a day. Remember today it's International Youth Day, guys. International Youth Day. So just tweet something, something. Hashtag International Youth Day. So Katile. Hello, everyone. Hello, Katile. I think can you hear me? Happy International Youth Day from Youth Body Africa and Africa for Africa Youth for SGDs. Meet us tomorrow for day five. We'll be talking about youth, passion, and talents. Bye. 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 So Katila has been one of the best planners ever. So guys, goodbye. In enjoy your day. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.